The stock's overpriced ahead of this week's key economic data and earnings season just around the corner. Let's ask the dean of valuations, Aswath Demoterin, NYU Stern School of Business Professor of Finance. Professor, welcome back. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. I feel like you've taken a bit of a bearish turn um, from your notes. Is that accurate? an accurate assessment of your current market view? I, I, I am more worried than I was a couple of months ago, I mean, or even six weeks ago. And there are a couple of things. One is the good news for this year has been that earnings estimates have been going up. They're not by a lot, but almost consistently over the course of three, three months as earnings reports come out. But at the same time, inflation seems to be much more stubborn than people thought it was going to be at the start of the year. So I think tomorrow's numbers are going to be pretty significant in where the market goes next. And to be quite honest, that's where inflation goes for the rest of the year is going to drive the market, not what the Fed does or does not do. But you think tomorrow morning is a binary event. Something too hot could mean the end of this. Uh, would you say it's the end of the rally itself? No, not necessarily, but I think that uh, to the extent that people have pulled back already, and I see a lot more skeptics in the market now than six weeks ago, it gives them another reason to stay on the sidelines. So even if they're not selling, they're not buying, and that can, that can by itself cause uh, have an effect on, on the market. So I think it's going to be not necessarily the event, but it's going to be one of a series of events, just as in 2022, with a collection of inflation announcements that got us into trouble. This is going to be one more piece of information we use to make a judgment on, you know, where's inflation going? You, and I have you, a feeling. Yeah, go ahead. No, you know, please, I, I, forgive me, you go ahead. Now, I was going to say, looking at the bond market, which to me is the best indicator of what investors think about expected inflation, and you look at the T-bond rate is up from 3.88% to 4.35, 4.4%. That suggests to me that investors in the bond market are expecting inflation to continue to stay about 3%, no matter what the Fed says about that inflation. So you suggested to our producers, and I'm quoting from the note here, the market is over-adjusted to two positive developments over the course of the last year, the decline in inflation from the heights of 22 and the receding of worries about recession. You sound like you're stealing a page from Jamie Dimon's note, you know, where, where he suggests you could see a, a further spike in rates and that the market's just gotten way too optimistic and, and over its skis on the idea that the economy is just out fully out of the woods. And I, and I agree with Jamie on that one, because I think that especially on the inflation front, inflation's history is it's incredibly stubborn. And you think that you put it away for a while, but it keeps coming back. And while the, the probability might be low that you're going to go back to a 2022 level, there is a chance it could happen. I mean, the economy is hot, commodity prices are up. So I don't think you can rule it out. And I don't think the market's incorporating that likelihood enough in terms of pricing it in. What's your own view on, on rate cuts? Because I would assume that it, in, in some respects, that has to partially at least color your view on the valuation of the market. I'll be quite honest. The, the Fed can raise rates, cut rates, or do nothing to rates. T-bond rates, which is what I watch. I don't care about the T-bill rate as much. T-bond rates are going to take their own path. And that path is going to be independent of what the Fed does. I mean, remember last year, the Fed, you know, if, if, if you think about raising rates, they raised the rates three times. The rates, the T-bond rate did not move over the course of the year. It was responding to inflation. And I'll make the same prediction for this year. On December 31st of 2024, when we look at the T-bond rate, whether it's 3% or 5% will have nothing to do with whether the Fed cut rates. It'll have everything to do with whether inflation is below 25 or 2% or whether it stays above 3%. Do you think the market's overvalued today? I think it is setting itself up for disappointments, at least in the second half of the year. I, I think that if you think in terms of asymmetry, the risks on the downside are higher than the risks on the upside. I'm not one of those who sells everything and runs for the hills because I don't think it's ever worked for me. I'm a terrible market timer. But this is not the kind of market I would jump in with both feet because um, you are, I think, heading in. And it's not just economic uncertainty. It's political uncertainty. I'm surprised the market is not factoring in some of those uncertainties more in pricing stocks. Some would suggest the only thing that really matters in the face of everything is the trend change from the Fed, that we're going to get cuts, we assume, at some point, and why fight the Fed? 
You know what, I've been hearing that since the start of the year and markets are up in spite of the fact that the much promised Fed cuts have not come yet. I'll make a prediction again, the Fed cuts rates. I wouldn't be surprised the market went down rather than up. With us tonight is KKM Financial founder and CEO Jeff Kilberg, also a CNBC contributor and Piper Sandler, chief market technician Craig Johnson. He'll look at the market aspect of this as well, guys. Welcome back. Jeff, you were there the night we got the I bet you. I bet you. We got, you know, uh, rates have kind of, I bet you they've gone up since then. Doesn't mean they will continue. What, though, are you expecting from tomorrow's CPI? Because I just showed all those, and you're a former commodity, current commodity guy. I just showed all those prices that are re accelerating. I think we get a higher than expected number, Sully. And to your point, I wasn't a mathematician at University of Notre Dame, but we are seeing an acceleration. In February, the CPI was 3.2. Tomorrow, the expectations are 3.4. So that is not an outlier. It's just acceleration of core inflation. So we're going to have to see once they strip out food and energy. But to your point, I think it's an outlandish statement back in January. If you would have said we are going to see rate hikes this year, everyone was expecting six rate cuts, maybe three. Now we're down to two, maybe one. So that question that you proposed earlier is going to be contingent upon that CPI number tomorrow. But I actually think we're going to see an acceleration because if you remember back in November, Sully, the stock market was 25% lower. Now we have $10 trillion more of valuation to play with, more CapEx. Consumers are feeling stronger. So there's a little bit of a variable here. So I think we're actually going to see a surprise uptick in inflation. You know, listen, Craig, you've been more right than you've been wrong. But all of Wall Street, there is not one woman or man out there that is right 100% of the time. And strategists, they make their expectations about rates and where they might go. They are allowed to change them. And they have been changing them. Let's take a look at this, right? We are seeing the expectation, to Jeff's point, we were kind of in that mostly the average guess was three rate cuts. Now we continue to reduce the expectations for that. Where do you see inflation and interest rates going over the next oh, six to 12 months? Well, Sully, as you know, I'm a pictures kind of guy. I like to look at a lot of the charts, and I think the charts tell us a lot about what's happening with inflation right now and also sort of what the expectations are from the bond market. If you just take a look at 10-year uh, bond yields at this point in time, they're starting to trend higher, and they have been making a very simple series of higher highs and higher lows. I think this is going to be a very fascinating interest uh, CPI print tomorrow because if we start seeing 10-year bond yields working their way up toward 4.5, I don't think equity markets are going to be real happy. And I think if you start to see uh, even a push closer to that 5%, which, again, it's not my forecast, but if these CPI numbers are hotter than expected, then the 10-year bond yield is going to respond. And at that point in time, equity markets are going to come in and they're going to pull back. And I think you're going to see uh, fewer rate cuts coming into play. Right now, it's, selling, it's about two and a half rate cuts is what's priced in. And again, that's still maybe too high. Yeah, two and a half. And, and to Jeff's point, and Jeff responded to yourself, I guess, which is if, it, if you're right, it comes in hotter we could see that two and a half, and I know there's no such thing as a half, but you get the point. It's right. sort of all the estimates that are aggregated up go to two or one and a half. And to, to, do you agree uh, that the market won't like that? Or has the market the, already expected that, and that's why rates have gone up and NVIDIA has fallen? I don't think the market has expected nor priced that in. But Craig brings up a great point, and I always look to the bond market for leadership. And Craig talked about the 10-year going up to 4.5% or 5% being problematic. I think the problem is already here at 4.36 in the 10-year note. With the 10-year note, with expectations, it was supposed to be down at 3.5% by now in Q2 of 2024. And here we are. I think there's a lag effect. There's a disconnect. We had uber sensitivity to the bond market, equity markets I'm talking about, the way equity is related and correlated to the bond market. But now, with the 10-year note elevated, we haven't seen stocks slow down. So I think there is an opportunity for the S&P 500 to pull back to Craig's point. I see 49.50 on the chart. I'm not going to step on any charts. That's Craig's world. But at the end of the day, it seems a little overvalued up here, Sully. Maybe CPI is that catalyst to get things repriced, which would be healthy for all market participants. Look, we are looking at yields popping up, and we are very close to the number here. They should be populating on the screen. This is, as Becky pointed out, March Consumer Price Index. The headline number expected to be up three-tenths is hotter than expected. It's up four-tenths of a percent, four-tenths of a percent, which equals our last look 
And, of course, uh, to look for a higher number would be August of last year when it was up 0.5. But in between, we're as low as 0.1 in October of last year. This doesn't seem like it's cooling very quickly here. 0.4 if you strip out food and energy. Back-to-back .4s last month as well. As Becky pointed out, we were expecting .3. Uh, to find a higher number, you'll go to April of last year when it was .5. And in between, the low number was two-tenths several times last year. If you look at year-over-year -year CPI, uh, we were expecting 3.4, hotter than expected, 3.4. Five. This is three-tenths, three-tenths hotter than we looked at in the rearview mirror, 3.2. To find a bigger number than 3.5, you're going back to May of last year when it was, oh, I, excuse me, I am wrong, September of last year when it was 3.7. And finally, what many would consider the most important number, uh, year-over-year -year CPI core, 3.8. Hotter than expected equals the rear view mirror. The, to find a higher number, January was 3.9. And what's the lowest it's been of late? Well, 3.8, our last look at what we have today, actually is the lowest since 3.0 in April of 21. The issue is it's still running hot. Now, many don't cover the indexes. To me, this is very enlightening. If you look at the non-seasonally adjusted Headline CPI index started in 1913. It's coming out today at 312.332, which is another all-time high. Meaning, if you go back to 1913, you won't find a higher number. And on the CPI core index, which is seasonally adjusted, the number here is 316.7. And that also is the highest ever. But this series was started in 1957. Interest rates... They're basically playing with 4.5% on a 10-year. We see pre-opening equities. Dow futures have dropped to about 350 points. Uh, I am sure, I am sure that the percentages are moving, and probably Steve Leisman will point that out. The June had popped back up above a 50% chance only slightly before the number. Is the record-setting rally now in serious jeopardy as rate cuts get pushed further and further out? with some now wondering if we'll get any at all. Let's ask Josh Brown. He's the co-founder and CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management and a CNBC contributor. He's with me, as you can see, at Post 9. It's good to see you. Rick Reeder, BlackRock, tweeting earlier, this was definitely a setback. That's the word he used. Does it change your view on the market? Does it change the game for the Bulls? I'm not one of these I told you so people, but I told you we were going to play this game cut off, cut on. Today is a decidedly cutoff day. It's exactly what you would expect to see if you think that we're set back from three down to two, from June down to July. That's exactly what's playing out on your screen. This is what I would tell you. You got small caps being hurt the worst. Again, textbook for a cutoff day. The IWM is down 3%. The S&P is down 1%. Uh, value underperforming growth. By the way, one of the only green stocks on my screen right now. NVIDIA, not a value stock. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but the value stocks are taking it on the chin. And then you think about why. It's very obvious we've had this huge rally in industrial companies, in financials. That's what tends to dominate the value indices. On the small cap side, consider 40% of debt held by Russell companies is floating rate versus just 21% for the S&P. So everything that's happening on your screen right now is exactly what you would have predicted if I would have given you this inflation print yesterday. Why is that relevant to tomorrow? Here's why. None of these rate panics have been a lasting hurdle for the S&P 500. We tend to process these things over 48 to 36 hours, and we will be back to the original game we were playing. And I think what you're seeing today is counter trend. The number one debate now, as silly as it sounds, is June versus July. The number two debate is two versus three in 2024. So let's say they go in July and they can't go in June. When's the next opportunity? They're not going to go in September. Too political. Can't do it in front of you. So you get July, December. Those are your two cuts for 24. If that's a reason to not buy any of the stocks that you want to buy, I can't figure out that connection. So I think for the allocator that's watching this action, I think you're looking at an opportunity to get long, not to panic because you're getting slightly less relief on the interest rate okay, side. So you then don't think that today marks some kind of game changer for a rally that started at the end of October, has set new records, 
And even though we've had to rethink the direction of the Fed along the way, the greater trend is still up. It, look, it's a game changer if you're one of these people who piled into semis in the last two weeks, forgetting that they're cyclical. Um, it, it, it's certainly every single component of the SMH is down today, except NVIDIA. So, yes, if you chase the momentum trade because you thought rate hikes were going to continue to fuel it, maybe it's a game changer for you. I think most people have not been playing that game. I think for most people, they're in a good position. They're looking at the rest of their portfolio. Some of it's very rate sensitive. Some of it isn't. And they're just fine on a day like today. And I don't think materially anyone would really say like, oh, my whole investing outlook for the next year is now changed. But right now for a deeper look at how the Fed will be looking at the new CPI data, former Fed governor uh, Frederick Michigan. He's now a Columbia University professor and a CNBC contributor. Um, I, I'm going to read you this. This is Jason Furman, who's just taken to, to Twitter, our old uh, friend at Harvard. He says, overall, it's a mystery to me why anyone thinks the Fed might cut rates in June. The labor market data is screaming a cut isn't needed for one side of the mandate, and the price data is screaming that it could be dangerous for the other side of the mandate. Are you in agreement or disagreement with Mr. Furman? Well, I wouldn't use the screaming <laughs> so strong in that regard. But uh, that clearly the Fed has made a commitment to keep inflation low and get it back to its 2% level. And I think that's absolutely the right thing for them to do. Uh, and uh, the path was looking pretty good for a while uh, because inflation was coming down. Uh, there was actually some progress on tightness in the labor market. It's not seen in the unemployment rate. But when you look at vacancies relative to unemployment, which is a, a measure that seems to work a lot better uh, in recent years, uh, they made a lot of progress. But... The problem is now that the economy has been very strong and basically the uh, decline in inflation is stalling. Now, also, most of the decline in inflation was from the removal of the supply shocks and, and, right. and supply chain problems. But so, Rick, though, bottom line is still the Fed's got a lot of work to do. Take us inside the Federal Reserve right now. I mean, I, could t I imagine they're having a party inside Mar-a-Lago right now. I want to know what's happening inside the Federal Reserve right now beside a pity party, which is to say, uh, do they, what do they do? when they see numbers like this? I, well, I think the answer is that they, they stay the course, uh, that they basically have a, a, a moderately tight policy, uh, which was very effective in, in helping bring inflation down, uh, and uh, also very importantly, very effective in containing inflation expectations from rising, which is one of the reasons why outcomes have been so good. But uh, the inflation numbers are stalling now, and the economy's strong. So the Fed just has to keep staying the course. I don't think they need to raise rates because I think that they're sufficiently tight in the in the in terms of the current policy stance, but they have to stay stay the course and indicate to the markets that that's their job. They what does that mean? We, we've been we've been on this idea that there's a, a three rate three rates cuts going. We had somebody on, by the way, who said there was going to be a rate cut starting in June and it was going to happen every month for the rest of the year, which which I, I you know now is completely disbelievable. If it wasn't disbelievable, you know what it was said. Well, a little bit nutty in the sense that uh, that would mean that we basically have a depression or a very, another financial crisis, but I don't think that's in the cards, but we still do have a very strong economy.